Uh, which screen are you seeing of mine? Um, you're showing you're showing your full screen of your PowerPoint. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have multiple screens or just one? Well, I'm trying to get um, some people approved to get in last minute approvals. Okay. Uh, Bernard, you, you teed up and ready to go? I'm going to go ahead and, and kick this off. Let's see, make sure he's there. I'm here. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. And I apologize for us being a little bit delayed when we're trying to get everybody connected through a computer and Zoom. Um, tends to take a few minutes, and this is our first time, so we'll work out the bugs a little. Uh, my name is Paul Tamburino, and I'm vice chair of the city of Charleston's um, Citizens Police Advisory Council. And tonight, what we want to do is we want to present to you the first and what we hope to be a series of educational sessions um, that help bridge some of the communication between the community and the Charleston Police Department. So I uh, just just to reiterate, I um, want just remind everybody what the CPAC mission is. Um, and rather than trying to explain, I'm just going to read it because it, it's pretty self-explanatory. The mission of the Charleston Citizen Police Advisory Council is to bring together people of diverse backgrounds encompassing ethnicity, academia, business leaders, faith-based organizations, elected officials, media, and or law enforcement to create an open dialogue and understanding. Through this process, the realization that public safety and individual rights must live in harmony in order to reduce crime, eliminate fear, and create an environment of trust and transparency that will ultimately foster communication, improve relations and cooperation. So in this series, this is um, uh, being run by this the communication subcommittee of CPAC. Um, and we hope that this is just a, one of our various means that we're gonna use to be able to communicate. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the best intro you're gonna get. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Bloom, um, who's one of our CPAC members, council members, to kick this off. Emily? Hi, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. My name, thank you, Paul. My name is Emily Broom, and I am a member of CPAC, and I am on the subcommittee um, for the communications subcommittee who, like Paul said, is responsible for these informational sessions that we plan to be hosting over the next several months on a variety of topics. Um, our goal is to keep the presentation tonight to 20 minutes, and we did have some questions that were submitted ahead of time that I will be asking at the end. If anybody that is attending the presentation tonight has any additional questions, if you want to submit them in the chat, we will take time to look at those if we have time to address them at the end. Um, and um, we'll take care of that at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, just to be cognizant of everyone's time tonight, um, we'll go ahead and get this started. And I'm not sure who has um, control of the slides. That is not me, but. So, Emily, I, I'll take. I'll take control of it there in a second, um, unless anybody else has any other introductions. Well, let me just say this for those that don't know. Lieutenant Byrne is the, is the um, Zone 9 commander, patrol commander, and that is the Central Business District. And so this is why we've asked him to come on and speak about uh, this topic, because that's, I mean, that's his area of control, and nobody really knows it better than he does. So, uh, Lieutenant Byrne, you're up. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Um, let me go ahead and share this screen here. And uh, bear with me. This is uh, this is the first time as a panelist on a Zoom, so I'm getting to learn it a little bit with y'all. 
Okay. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. And um, I'd like to acknowledge CPAC and, and the work that everybody is doing. Um, I think this is a very important thing for us to have this communication between citizens and the police department. Uh, you know, this is a, a partnership and we need to make sure that we protect it as such. Uh, with that in mind, one of the things that uh, we first wanted to talk about here is what's been going on in Upper King Street in Team 9. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, attention being paid to King Street over the last, say, two years, three years. Um, sometimes it's been uh, better, sometimes it's been worse, and at all times it's been a, a matter of public interest. So that's one of the things that I wanted to start with in these CPAC meetings, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, as Paul said, my area of, of command is Team 9, which is the central business district for the city of Charleston. We focus on King Street from right about line, uh, right where the crossover is for 26 and the exit ramp from the Ravenel Bridge. From, from there, we go down to Market Street and over through the market to East Bay and a little bit on East Bay Street. So it's a, a very small, but very vital area for the city. Upper King Street has really been the life, lifeblood of that for the past few years. Um, if anybody is from Charleston and remembers, say 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't always that way, but it is a thriving area and we wanna protect it as such. Um, a couple of years, excuse me, uh, about a year ago, we started seeing some changes in the Upper King Street area. Um, we saw crowd dynamics changing, and a lot of that had to do with the reopening of the city as the pandemic restrictions were lifted. We saw that um, people were coming to Charleston from out of town, which wasn't unusual, of course, being a tourist city, but they were coming here and feeling like things were a bit more open compared to some of the cities they were coming from. We saw folks originally from just here in state and then North Carolina then we had a huge influx of people from Washington, D.C., and a lot of the folks that were coming here were just looking to blow off steam after having been in lockdowns and restricted areas, and in fact, a lot of those areas were still in that, in that uh, type of environment. We also saw a strange dynamic that um, college students from across the country were coming to Charleston to study. Now, we're, not used, we're, we're used to having college students downtown, but these were weird because um, they were re attending classes in Massachusetts and Texas and other places, but they came to Charleston so they could still maintain that college environment, that, that college experience of going out and, and having a good time. And while we welcome that, it was definitely having an impact on the way that um, Upper King Street, which attracts a lot of the college students, was functioning. Some of the problems that we started seeing were uh, a rise in assaults and aggravated assaults, uh, violent crime. We saw officers responding to some large fights and a number of other situations that really either um, had the potential for, or in some cases actually required use of force um, to break up some of these fights. And so we took note of that as well as just the anecdotal evidence of businesses saying that they felt a little uneasy. They were asking for increased police presence. Uh, everybody kind of felt we were on a bubble of some type and there was a, uh, an uneasiness to it. Just walking down King Street at night, you could see a number of these things. We had street parties that were out on the, uh, um, that were out on the road, people dancing on cars. We had music videos being filmed. We had people who would bring uh, alcohol down and just have a party out of the trunk of their car in a parking space. Um, it was, as many people described it, it was Bourbon Street-esque. We saw that these, kind, these types of activities created traffic and pedestrian safety concerns. People were, as you can see here, riding on cars, pedestrians crossing anywhere in the road that they wanted to, um, crowds just kind of moseying down King Street as traffic tried to pass in both directions. Cars were going in and out of parking spaces. Um, we had some people that actually did get hit by vehicles. One person uh, was run over by a truck. So we had a number of issues that, that gave us concern from a traffic standpoint. The crowds also stuck around far longer than we ever wanted or expected them to. 
bar closing at 2 a.m. really didn't mean much because the party was in the street and in the parking lots. We saw that people were sticking around because there was food available, because there was a good time to be had even beyond the closing of the actual businesses. Um, our officers, as, as this picture illustrates, were right in the middle of it trying to get crowds to move along, but it was really uh, an uphill battle when a lot of these uh, a lot of these folks were sticking around, and I'm not talking about 2:15 or 2:30 in the morning. We were seeing uh, we were seeing the party going on until four or five uh, four or five o'clock in the morning. Part of the problem there that kept people out was the mobile food vending. Food vendors knew that they would have um, a, a a reliable stream of customers after people would drink and drink and drink. And finally at five o'clock in the morning, or excuse me, at two o'clock in the morning, get pushed out and they were hungry and they wanted some place to go. Um, they didn't have to go more than a block or so because there were multiple food vendors that would stay out until everybody was fed. That kept people standing in line, having fights, getting in arguments, bumping into people, um, all kinds of problems like that. We saw graffiti on the rise. These crowds were, um, were not always there just to have a good time. We saw um, artistic graffiti. We saw um, all kinds of, of markings and taggings. Uh, it was definitely taking away from the area that we wanted to have. Litter was the same problem. Um, we saw litter just tossed down, discarded at the end of the nights. The streets looked filthy. Uh, it was not a place that invited you to come back shopping the next morning. Um, we also had these street fights. Like I said, we saw the violent crime on the rise. This is a clip from just one Snapchat that, uh, that showed down at King and Ann Street, a group of people who were fighting another group of people. You could see it on this camera and also on some of the security cameras from businesses and from the city where this fight took place in the middle of the street, uh, people just getting beaten and kicked and certainly not the type of environment that was welcoming to families and, and the people that uh, would come out and spend money to have dinner and, and enjoy a night. This was um, getting to be somewhat chaotic and our officers were having to deal with this on a regular basis. It also puts a very big damper on, on the tourism that so many people have worked so hard to foster. Uh, when this thing is, when this type of thing is out there, it really takes away from the invitational aspect of Charleston and people look to go elsewhere. Finally, we had the straw that broke the camel's back. On May 2nd through 9th, that week, we had a number of aggravated assaults. On May 2nd, a young lady was shot in the leg in the parking garage at 63 Mary Street. And if I recall correctly, I believe she lost her foot as a result of that shooting. Um, one week later, we had on May 9th, three people shot and three, three people stabbed in multiple incidents in just about a three block uh, distance on King Street. Uh, several of those occurred not only at two o'clock, but as things kept on going, like I said, that street party, never ending party atmosphere had people uh, at four o'clock and 4.30 in the morning still out there uh, falling victim to some violent crime. This is a clip from a surveillance video that was out there. You can see the crowd um, right next to the car that you see there, there's a person that's been stabbed. And we had dozens of people just hanging out there near one of the food trucks that were uh, running from the, from the scene as soon as they realized what was going on. Um, and this, like I said, this video was at four something in the morning, I believe 4.30 in the morning. So the party just was not ending. Two days later, we had a press conference in Marion Square. That press conference included the mayor and city council members, uh, you can see Chief Reynolds, and more importantly, um, you see over the mayor's shoulders, you see owners of King Street businesses. They had enough, we had enough, it was time for us to do something. And that was, um, that was where the, the, the other shoe dropped. We, in, we introduced the Upper King Street Safety Plan, which comes in multiple, uh, which has multiple facets to it. Thursdays through Saturdays from nine to three was the real crux of the plan. We had additional officers from across the city responding down to King Street to assist our team nine officers. We introduced a one-way traffic flow 
from Spring down to John Street. Uh, it was originally Spring to Mary, but we ended up extending that when we saw that uh, it would be advantageous to do so. We also eliminated parking during those hours on King Street and towed vehicles that were parked uh, where, where we had meters that were bagged. And we, we assigned officers specifically to the parking lots and parking garages behind and one block off of King Street so that they could check the areas where we knew people were getting into fights back at their cars, where we knew people were keeping guns in vehicles. We also augmented our ID scanning program uh, at the doors to, to supplement some of the security teams, the private security teams at individual establishments. And we strongly encouraged and actually got a lot of support from these security teams and establishment managers to do ID, ID scanning of their own. <clears throat> Excuse me. We added light towers downtown on King Street to uh, brighten up some of the areas that were dark where people like to congregate oftentimes for no good. And the other departments of the city joined in with street sweeping and litter pickup, street sweeping at the end of the night at, five in the, at four and five in the morning and litter pickup throughout the day to make sure that King Street was a place that people would wanna to return to, to go shopping and, and have lunch and, and brunch during the daytime. The city council introduced a food vending ordinance change where street uh, street vendors had to be off of the street by the, uh, they had to close up shop by 1.30 and that really reduced the crowds. It, it did a lot to eliminate some of that never ending party type of atmosphere. And then, like I said, we partnered with our uh, private security teams at the establishments as well as the management of establishments we, inc we increased our communication extraordinarily. We talked to them very bluntly about problems that we saw. We tried to get ahead of the curve with them and get their buy-in so that they would be able to uh, deal with problems before they became criminal issues out on the street. Um, we still do that. Actually, we have a very strong relationship between our evening shifts, particularly our evening supervisors and the 20 plus establishments that make up the Upper King Street area. The traffic pattern, like I said, we stopped northbound traffic on King Street using barricades and cones and signage. We had the police officers park over on the, the northbound side. It left a lane so that emergency traffic could start to flow through there if necessary. One of the big problems that we heard from the fire departments and EMS was that in an emergency, they couldn't get anywhere because there was so much pedestrian and vehicular traffic that they couldn't get to their calls. So this created a lane for them to have for emergency access. It also slowed traffic, but it kept it moving. Uh, people were not allowed to stop. There's no, there's no pickups or, or um, discharging of, of passengers in traffic. Uber and Lyft are being pushed to the side streets in accordance with the previous ordinances uh, that had not been strongly enforced in the past. So, um, we, we stopped a lot of that discharging and pickup of passengers on King Street itself. We also left a place for the uh, pedicabs to be able to move safely so that they didn't have to get out onto Meeting Street and run the risk of being injured out there. This is what the barricades look like. This is our truck that runs three nights a week out there on King Street. It's a very industrial construction looking barricade. It's a uh, um, Department of Transportation approved uh, barricade and, and reflective cones. Um, our officers go out three nights a week and they deploy and recover these in this truck and they execute that plan again from spring down to John. The light towers had a significant impact. Uh, Dixie Furniture over on the left, as you can see, is a vacant business, uh, commercial space for lease. That overhang in front of it creates a very dark area and we saw a number of people that would uh, hang out in that area that were oftentimes conspiring up to no good, getting into fights. Uh, we had a number of events happen right there in front of Dixie Furniture when uh, one group of people would end up getting into a fight with another. Uh, so we decided that needed some more illumination to discourage gathering and loitering there. Same thing over at some of the places, uh, this is on the right side, you see just south of Morris Street, that, that photo was taken from Mary Street. We were very successful with what we did. Um, we did an analysis at the six month mark back in November to see whether or not what we were doing was working. 
at that six month mark, comparing to the previous six months, we saw a 18% reduction in simple assaults. We saw a 52% reduction in aggravated assaults, which includes stabbings, shootings, things like that. We saw a 60% reduction in sex offenses, which we attribute largely to having those officers in the, the parking lots and on the side streets, making sure that people were getting home safely and discouraging people from doing um, whatever, they, whatever they might otherwise be doing, grabbing people or, or, or uh, otherwise committing offenses. We saw a 58% increase in disorderly conduct cases and a 254% increase in drug violation cases, which tells me that officers were being much more proactive. They were able to investigate. They were not just responding to calls. They were able to investigate tips and suspicious activity and find what was going on. They found drugs, they found uh, poor conduct, disorderly conduct, and they also found guns. In those six months, 40 firearms were seized from the Upper King Street area. And that was not just a, a random gun here or there. Many times we saw multiple guns being taken from vehicles in connection with drugs, in connection with alcohol, in connection with other arrests. Um, those guns were off the street. We know that they would have been used in some cases because we were able to determine who had them and what kind of grief and beef they had with other people who we knew are out on Upper King Street. They were out there to settle cases, settle these grudges. And I firmly believe that we prevented further aggravated assaults, maybe even homicides from taking place by the seizure of those firearms. False IDs. Um, we took a bunch and so did the security teams. These are just some of the false IDs that were taken. This, this photo shows six weeks from one establishment during the summer when college students weren't even largely here. Um, we believe that the false IDs and the underage drinking and the college students being in from out of town contribute to a drug market that contributes to uh, people trying to claim or uh, or, or, or take advantage of turf, if you will, um, which led to some of the disputes that we had downtown and led to some of the shootings and, and stabbings. This is another uh, shot. This has several hundred fake IDs taken from just the downtown area, um, just the central business district, Upper King Street area, either counterfeit IDs that are being purchased and, and uh, brought in or uh, the use of somebody else's ID. Numerous people charged for these uh, offenses. Some of them just confiscated by the bartenders and then turned over to us at the end of the day. Uh, but these were all from the Upper King Street area. Like I said, we took guns, we took drugs. This is just one arrest from um, one vehicle, three Glock pistols, one of which at the top there you see has a laser sight on it. Uh, multiple types of of narcotics. These guns were, were loaded. They were ready to go. Um, there was no reason for them to be down there in the Upper King Street area for people trying to have a good time. So where are we next? The city is working with us to research uh, more aesthetically pleasing traffic barricades and bollards and lighting options. We know that what we have out there currently looks like a construction zone. It's not very appealing to the eye. We want to change that. We're working on more permanent solutions that are aesthetically pleasing and don't detract from the beauty that Charleston is known for. We're looking at late night establishment accountability measures to make sure that we are able to hold to task those late night establishments and operators that don't necessarily fall in line, that don't um, have, that don't have a, a, a desire to follow all of the rules. There have been a few of those and we wanna hold them accountable. We're continuing to focus our police resources on safety and livability issues, making sure that people have a reason to come down and that they enjoy it when they come down. And the city is doing an Upper King Street Business Improvement District through the Office of Neighborhood and Business Services. Um, those are some of the things that are coming next, but I'd invite you to ask any questions or let me explain any of the issues that I brought up even more fully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Byrne, and um, thank you so much for your team's hard work, um, Team 9, um, on this initiative and all their hard work on a daily basis. 
in the central business district. Um, we have had some questions submitted ahead of time and some tonight on the chat. So if anybody else has any other questions, please put them into the Q&A section. Um, one of the questions we have is this current enforcement and the changes to the policing on King Street pulling any resources from other areas? And this kind of ties in actually to a question we got as well. Um, there seems to be an increase in side street activities on after closing hours of the businesses, specifically on Morris Street. Um, is the CPD doing anything to mitigate the side street hangout um, after hours? So good questions, yes. Um, and yes to both of those. Um, anytime that we increase staffing in one area, we decrease staffing someplace else. But that's not to say that we're leaving any place uncovered. Um, I know when we talk about increased staffing, we don't want to, we don't always want to talk about that. But I think it's also important to acknowledge it would be terribly inefficient for us to have a pool of officers sitting somewhere doing nothing until we need them. Um, so we we put our resources out there uh, at all times in the places that we need to. When we've started pulling to Upper King Street. We brought officers from across the city in from our second shift while our third shift covered the streets uh, around the city. Um, when we started seeing issues in West Ashley, we started moving our team four officers, the, the West Ashley officers, back out there to address that. So I guess you could say we took away from King Street to, to do that. We're bringing those officers back down now as we see some new things on the horizon that we need to address. So it's more appropriate to say that we move resources around to the places and the needs that, that are in front of us at the time. Um, the second half of your question about Morris Street and some of those side streets, that's always a concern for us. We know that people don't uh, largely live on King Street, that they need to get home to either dorms or apartments or homes or, or get to a vehicle somewhere. So those have, always been, um, those have always been areas of vulnerability that we've paid attention to. Yes, we've increased the officer presence in those areas, but importantly, we also partner with College of Charleston and the officers that are on patrol throughout the city in teams one and two to make sure that we have those areas covered. The city does joint patrols with the College of Charleston. Um, there's a lot of presence in that Morris Street, St. Philip Street corridor. We're working on increasing the lighting in those areas, and that is definitely an area that is a, uh, a focus area for us. Thank you. Our next question is, is this a direct response from the civil disturbances that happened on King Street in May of 2020? No, no, this actually has nothing to do with the civil disturbances and any of the, uh, the uh, First Amendment demonstrations that we saw. This is all, um, the, the impetus behind all of this arose much later as we saw COVID start to, um, excuse me, the restrictions associated with COVID start to loosen up. We saw significant changes in King Street, Upper King Street in particular, from what it had historically been. Um, we saw dynamics that were changing. We saw attitudes and uh, intentions changing. So this really had to do more with COVID and, and the restrictions and the, the the fact that Charleston opened up earlier than other cities around the East Coast uh, than anything else. This has, in fact, I can't even think of a correlation between um, any of the any of the civil disturbance issues from la from spring of 2020 and now. Okay, our next question: um, Are y'all tracking um, the percentage of arrests? that have been stated um, in a racial breakdown, specifically how many have been African-American? So I don't have that. Um, I can say anecdotally, I would I think Paul. I think Paul has that possibly to chime in on. Okay. No, I wouldn't have that statistic. So. Oh, sorry. Continue um, on, Lieutenant Bird. I'm sorry. I saw in the chat that Paul was answering. So. So I don't have the, that data. Um, anecdotally, I'd say that, that uh, uh, most of our arrests, most of our citations down there are not African-American. 
Um, but I, I would have to defer to our crime analysis unit to pull up specifics. Um, I, I would say that most of our arrests and citations, most of our enforcement action is probably on the um, younger side, I would say like college aged and probably, I'm not even gonna put a percentage guess on it, but it, most of them are, are likely white males, white females. Okay, well, we're gonna change directions a little bit. And um, this is a question related to the businesses. Is there a bit pushback from the businesses and has this been hurting the businesses? So we have seen a little bit of pushback from some of the businesses, but for reasons that might not be expected, in terms of what we're doing at night, this is um, overwhelmingly welcomed by the businesses. In fact, many of them for quite a while asked for it. We saw that uh, they wanted the police presence. We've gotten praise for, for what we're doing. Um, the, the biggest places that we see pushback or, or negative feedback of any kind is actually from some of the daytime businesses that work right up until the point where we start to bag the parking meters and, and restrict parking because they're concerned about their customers, <clears throat> excuse me, they're concerned about their customers being able to access their stores. Um, we've, been, we've been responsive to that. There's a little bit of a, uh, a push and pull when it comes to uh, how much we can give before we lose the ability to restrict the parking and enforce it. So we're working on trying to find that balance, but overwhelmingly the nighttime uh, restrictions are embraced by our, our business community. They, like, any, like many other people, would like to see it more attractive, less construction-like. Let's face it, those orange and white barricades are not pretty to look at. They are very in your face and there's orange cones all over. And we have the light trailers that are exactly the same type that either the military or the construction companies or you know, a rental company would, would use. I mean, they, they are industrial looking. So that's why the city is looking at how we can make it a, a more pleasing, aesthetically pleasing to the eye welcoming environment. And I think the businesses will be very satisfied with that. We did have some pushback back in November when we talked about some of the late night entertainment ordinances. But again, I want to reiterate, those were ideas that were being floated. And as soon as we heard the, the voices of the, the business community, um, many of those ideas were abandoned and put back on the table for us to retool. And none of those have been enacted. So um, again, it's a partnership. We're very responsive to them. And I hope that uh, we continue to do that. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how much longer do you think these changes will continue? And um, I'll add something onto that. What is gonna be considered the victory at the end? Sorry, I just got my video working. Thank you very much. Um, so how long does this last? Uh, the mayor on May 11th last year said that this was gonna be for the foreseeable future. Um, we knew that it would be for many months. Um, I don't know if, we could, if I can say that it's indefinite, but it's definitely something that we want to continue because we've seen success with it. When I say that we want it to continue, I don't know that it will continue in its, in its current format. Um, I, I've said this many times, but we wanna refine this. We, and we have refined this, the number of officers, the deployment of those officers, where they go. We know that Upper King Street is shifting right now. Ann Street is about to um, kind of explode with business and, and with activity. Music Farm is about to reopen. The, uh, the folks that run Uptown Social at the north end of King Street, they are about to open two places on Ann Street. Uh, we have Deco down there. We have Dudley's down there. We've seen a lot more activity over at AC's Pub. So the businesses on the south end are really doing well in terms of their, um, their activity and their, their ability to draw patrons in. Um, as we know, though, sometimes that doesn't necessarily bring all joy and, and sunshine, and there's sometimes issues that we have to uh, be prepared for. So we are shifting our preparedness for that currently. Um, we want to make it look better. We want to make it uh, more inviting. So when I say that the, these initiatives, this Upper King Street safety plan is going to continue indefinitely, I mean the success that we have, the elements that have led to that success are intended to keep going for the foreseeable future. And I believe I have the, the police department and the mayor's support on that. Um, 
we also want to work with our police and fire colleagues to make sure that what we're doing is not interfering with their ability to do their jobs. So there is a constant refinement and uh, it will probably continue, but maybe not in the exact same form. We hope it will always be better. And that, forgive Thank me, Emily, was there, so a second half to that, was there a second half to that question? No, I think you, you, um, you handled that and got it taken care of. Um, thank you so much for your time. Just uh, paying attention to everyone's time. I'm going to hand this back over to Paul um, to wrap this up. Senator Byrne, I want to thank you very much. Um, for everybody on the call, he, he put the entire presentation together. That was all him, and we're really impressed in the short amount of time he had to work with. In closing, also want to thank um, Captain Middleton, who's the patrol commander, um, division commander. Um, Captain McFadden, who's in charge of Office of Community Work at Policing. Um, and I also want to thank our CPAC chair, um, Tuan Fielding, for allowing us um, just the room to do this. And Emily did a great job. And thanks, everybody, for participating. If you would, um, everybody's got the information. Um, if you get any follow-up questions or concerns or you have recommendations on you know, different topics that we can bring up, please direct that to us. You know, we're looking for not only, you know, topics, but we're also looking for people willing to host just like uh, Lieutenant Byrne did. So I want to thank everybody and I appreciate your patience and us going Paul, over a little bit. Paul, uh, I have, yes, sir. I, no I noticed one more question from a citizen in the uh, chat. I'd like to just sure, answer that ahead. really quickly. It says with the reopening of those venues, is CPD actively hiring new officers? That's from Jack Handigan. Uh, Jack, I I'd like to thank you for your question. Yes, we are actively and always have been actively recruiting new officers. We have a very vigorous recruiting program. Um, Sergeant Gibson and Officer Cherry and their, their team has done a fantastic job of bringing in applicants and making uh, quality applicants into outstanding police officers. Um, we're not recruiting specifically because of those places on Ann Street reopening. We're recruiting because we have vacancies and we want the best cops to be able to serve. So if that answers your question, sir, I hope it does. Um, also, Paul, if you could give a quick refresher for when the next webinar is and what the topic is, if we know. We don't have that set yet. We wanted to see how you did before we bit off more than we could chew. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're our, you were our test subject. You did a great job. And the good news is you set the bar pretty high. So um, you'll probably get invited back. You're pretty good at this. Outstanding. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Grizzell. Um, Chairperson, um, Fielding, did you have anything you want to say before we end it? No, I just wanted to say, uh, Lieutenant Byrne, you did an excellent job. I think this was a great one for the first time. Looking forward to others and hope that the community will take advantage of these learning experiences and opportunities to communicate. And just to reiterate, reiterate what you said, uh, Vice Chairman Tamburino, if they have any questions, they can still go to the website and log any questions in as well. And this was recorded, so it will be posted for future review. Thanks again. Thank you all for your time, your participation, and your passion. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>